I'm really, really fortunate in, in terms of getting into cut flower uh, research that Dr. Nishwitz is so interested in focusing on diseases of cut flowers. She's so into it and she's, it's been fantastic because what we're learning is that um, a lot of this hasn't been documented in Utah yet. And we don't know the extent of what these different diseases can affect cut flowers, how to manage them and identify them. And so she's gotten really into this. We've written a few grants, which has allowed us to do cut flower surveys across Utah. And we've been really thankful to the farmers in our state because when they've been noticing um, cut flower crops that look a bit off, they've been very willing to send us samples so that they can be analyzed by Claudia's lab. So here we're gonna, um, I'm gonna present on the diseases she saw the most in 2021. The first is Dahlia mosaic virus, DMV. I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of this. It's one that just plagues dahlias. And there's actually three strains of Dahlia mosaic virus. Um, there's so D10, that's the most common. It's actually rumored to be part of the DNA uh, in dahlias, which is what not what Claudia is finding. Um, there's the Portland strain and the Holland strain. And so she's been um, back in 2019 when we started noticing these problems on dahlias in my field trial, she actually went and was able to get all of the testing um, so that we have the test kits to be able to, to perform these tests on dahlias. And so a single dahlia plant can have one of these strains or up to all three. So there can be every combination within the plants. And unfortunately, a lot of the industry is a bit dirty. So um, you can acquire plant stock that just comes with this. Um, but on top of that, if you have dirty stock and also have clean stock, it can be transmitted by aphids. And so that's been, that can be quite a challenge. Um, in trying to maintain in trying to maintain yield and not wanting to throw away plants, there's really not a way to cure uh, dahlias of there's not a way to cure dahlias of DMV, and so it's and it's easily spread um, across the plants. It also other thing that she's finding and learning is that it actually can get transmitted in the seed. So if a plant that is infected with any of these strains goes to seed, and I know for cut flower production where there's um, using cuttings or tubers, those are the kind of dahlias that we most are likely are to sell. But when we do grow them from seed, that that can get um, transmitted into the seed. And then also tubers. So there's been some kind of viral information, no pun intended, going on in social media that if the plant looks diseased, you know, let it go, it, save the tuber, next year it's going to be fine. And that could not be further from the truth. And so Claudia has done a lot of work to actually take sampling from different parts of the plant in looking at where this virus is. And it is definitely in the tubers too. So some symptoms to look for in the field um, to walk through is chlorosis of the leaves. And we've got pictures of this in the next slide. So this is yellowing in the leaves um, or vein clearing. It can look, but it can look like these other two viruses, um, tomato spotted wilt disease virus or uh, tobacco, <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, tobacco streak virus. And um, the leaves can also get a deformed shape. It can reduce flower production. Now, if all of the dahlias in a field have it, wouldn't necessarily notice this decrease in yield, um, but these can be problems. So the color breaking is really interesting because there's actually a lot of varieties that are, um, that, that that's kind of advertised that there's this streaking in the petals. Is this something that we're looking for? And that can often be caused by a virus actually. So. Pictures that um, she's taken in the lab. Here you can see this infected leaf. It's got this kind of unusual yellow spotting happening. That's definitely not a uh, nutrient deficiency. That's a sign of a virus doing that when it's just these kind of irregular spots throughout. There's no real clear pattern. Um, here's examples of the leaves that are deformed as well. And then this is a picture of a bloom from Nicholas in one of our greenhouse trials. And you can actually start to see that color breaking here in the petals. So right at the tip where we're losing some of the color and it's looking a bit yellowish, that's actually a sign of the virus. Um, so for management of DMV, the best thing to do if you notice it is to destroy the infected plant and not save the tubers. And the reason for this is because it just can get uh, transmitted to your clean stock. Try to find certified disease-free seed and tubers if you can. This is a challenge. I really hope this is something that industry moves with in the future. 
Um, and then using sticky cards to monitor for aphids. So it's important to check those sticky cards weekly. And um, Claudia mentioned that if you're not sure how to identify aphids on the sticky cards, you can actually take some saran wrap and loosely wrap it around the card, put it in a padded envelope and send it to her lab and she will, um, her team can, can diagnose what's, in, what's on there. So keep track of the field and call uh, when you can. I know that can be really hard to do, heartbreaking to do. We've had to do it up here. Um, we want to learn a lot more about DMV. We're really excited about it. We have some grants to do it, which allows us to offer Utah growers, only Utah growers, free testing. Um, our labs are not certified to take in plant samples from out of state. So um, if you are a, a cut flower farmer or enthusiast here in Utah and you have some dahlias this coming year that look suspicious, take a picture, um, email us with it, and then chances are we're going to ask you to take a sample and um, send it into our lab. Maybe we could even visit your farm this summer on our Dahlia tours, let us know. And we're really thankful to these two county faculty who are helping us um, on this trial too. So we are very interested in learning more about DMV viruses. And so please send your samples and contact us. The next thing that uh, Claudia has seen a lot of is damping off. I think any of us who start uh, any kind of plant from seed, this is near and dear to our hearts. So damping off is commonly caused by pythium. And it, uh, so it's a seedling disease. It actually lives in the soil. It's a soil borne pathogen. And um, the spores of pythium actually, it's almost like they have a li little tails on them and that allows them to swim through water. And so um, this, this can be a really devastating seedling disease. Some pictures of it, there's browning or yellowing of the leaves. Um, this is quintessential here where the stem right at the soil surface is dying off. And so if you see some of these uh, symptoms, chances are that the entire tray is actually affected and it's best to, um, to dispose of that tray and not try to hope that a few will still make it. So, um, and the reason for that is, so damping off, the, the management of it is to be as sanitary as possible. If you're reusing seed trays from year to year, make sure to disinfect them. A 10 to 15% bleach solution can work particularly well. Uh, we recommend soaking for 45 minutes to an hour. And then after that, wash it really well to get rid of the bleach. Um, otherwise that can cause some phytotoxicity. It can hurt your next round of seedlings just from the bleach alone. Um, if you're mixing uh, your own soil or bringing in your soilless media, having, bringing in something sterile um, can absolutely help. Another thing is to not over water. So when those trays are sitting in water, that makes it really easy for those spores to move. Because remember, they have that little, those tail-like features that let them swim through the water. Um, another thing is not planting the seeds too deep. And the reason for that is because then they're exposed to the soil or soil, soilless media longer, and that can put more stress on the seedling trying to get up and more stress generally means it becomes more susceptible. Um, if you can buy treated seeds or if you have a special pesticide license, you might even be able to treat your own seeds. Um, but generally speaking, our rule of thumb is that if you're holding a seed in your hand, however it lays flat, you should plant that about twice the depth of the height of that seed and that is plenty deep. Um, so those are some, some ways to manage. Now it might be tempting if you get uh, damping off and a couple of the plants make it to still plant them out. And that can, be a, that can be a pretty strong problem because it can actually lead to root rot um, later on in that, that crop's life. So leading right into that, pythium root rot is another common one that we see in cut flower crops. So um, pythium root rot is also caused by pythium. So it's the same pathogen that causes damping off, but it's what affects older plants, um, including cut flowers, vegetables, and hemp. So this is how it manifests later on. So if it doesn't die of damping off, it very well could die of root rot later on. And that's why it's important just to get rid of those trays. Um, symptoms are that the soil can look plenty wet, but the plants look like they are dehydrated or they start to wilt. Um, the roots become discolored. And the cortex may be easily pulled off with only the inner core of the root left. I think 
that sounds really complex, but I think we probably all experienced that. Um, and I'll have a picture here on the next page. But we have seen this, we've seen this in uh, Celosia, especially across flower farms. And this is one that we usually in thinking about vegetable farming, we often see this in kind of squash and melon types. So um, with Pythium root rot, this is a picture of a poinsettia actually. You can see the roots are a bit discolored and here's the general thickness of the roof of the root. But you know that feeling when um, the, the roots just seem kind of moist and then if you take your finger and, and slide it along the root, it just sloughs off the outside and you're left with this hair like bit. That's a really good sign that it's infected with Pythium root rot. So something to look for. Um, let's see, management of root rot is to be careful about not overwatering. Drip irrigation in general is a great idea for water conservation, but it also can help minimize disease incidence by keeping that soil a little bit drier. Um, disinfecting tools is a big one. So again, it comes down to sanitation practices. So things that come in contact of, of, with the soil, shovels would be a great example. Um, washing shovels, I know it sounds like a lot, um, but that is a great way to reduce incidence of pythium root rot. Alcohol is ideal actually for um, sanitizing shovels. Bleach is a little bit hard on metal, um, but another method is you could actually just use soap and water and then let it sit out in the hot sun and it'll heat up enough that it'll actually kill pythium. And then buying healthy transplants. So um, if plants look kind of yellow when you're buying them, it could be a nitrogen deficiency that's relatively common, but it also could be something wrong with the roots. It could be pythium, it could be nematodes, all these other things. And, and so it's important to only buy the healthiest transplants or produce the healthiest ones because if you don't, it actually is introducing it into the soil and it overwinters and can last for decades. So um, so trying to trying to avoid this upfront tends to be the best way to go. Um, Claudia had, had talked a bit to me about using biofumigants actually as a way to get rid of these things, but they're really difficult um, for us to get here in Utah. So it's probably not a, um, a realistic approach on that way. So just thinking about it more on the front, front end. The next is powdery mildew. And I, I think all of us have seen this to some extent, whether um, it's on our, our squash or lilacs, but it actually is a big one for cut flowers too. And, um, and so the important thing with powdery mildew is there's actually a lot of different species of powdery mildew and they are very specific to the host that they are infecting. So this particular species, Ambrosiae, is specific to Dahlia, Zinnia, and Celosia. So that powdery mildew we're seeing on our squash plants, it is not the same one that's infecting these cut flowers or similarly bindweed can get powdery mildew. That's a different species than what we're getting on these cut flowers. Um, so it's very specific to the host, but it looks the same as everything we've been used to, uh, like someone sprinkled powder or flour onto the leaves. So we get these white patches or spot splotches on the leaves that can easily turn into the whole leaf being covered. And the environmental conditions that welcome powdery mildew are exactly what we have here in Utah dry and warm. They, it does need a few um, hours of high humidity to be able to infect, um, but otherwise it just does great under dry and warm conditions. And so we usually see this later on in the season. So let's see here. Um, it doesn't like rain. So a lot of times, I guess I can say this under management too, but um, you know, here in Utah, we don't get as many pathogens because of our dry conditions, but this is one that really responds well to our dry conditions. Um, it, it really doesn't like rain. Uh, so some might say to use overhead irrigation to reduce incidence of pow powdery mildew, which is the case, but it'll tend to invite all the other pathogens if you do it. So we still recommend drip irrigation, um, but just knowing that that can be a challenge. So management, culture, uh, cultural, non-chemical means. Uh, the first is to try to find resistant varieties if those are available. That's a lot more slim pickings for cut flowers um, than maybe for other crops. Another is to remove the infected plant material at the end of the growing season because it can overwinter in the soil if that residue is left behind. I wouldn't even compost it, just put it right in the garbage. Um, and then plant spacing. And I know on small scale farms, it's really tough because we wanna optimize spacing for production 
in yield, maybe plant a little bit closer, but um, in terms of controlling pathogens, giving the plants a little bit more space, a little bit more wind flow can help a lot uh, with controlling these. Now for chemicals, um, there's chemical management options. And a lot of the fungicides that have the active ingredient with sulfur work extremely well. But the key for these, if we're using chemical means for control is that it has to be done when it's at this early stage where there's just a couple patches on the leaf, not after the leaf is, co is completely covered in powdery mildew, because at that point, there's so many spores present that chemical control is really not gonna make a difference. Um, so using a sulfur-based fungicide works great, but applying it every seven to 10 days is pretty key because that's in the life cycle of powdery mildew, that's how long it takes from spore infection to producing spores again. And so applying it um, regularly is important, but um, another precaution here, not only applying it in a timely manner, but also not applying it during the heat of the day is important. Otherwise it'll just toast the plants. So either applying it in very early morning where it has a few hours before it gets really hot or, or um, applying it at the end of the day helps a lot. Um, in this crop rotation really doesn't make a difference. Uh, you know, and we're already on more limited land with smaller farms in general, but it can blow in from hundreds of miles. So crop rotation really isn't gonna make a difference. And then uh, another methods we've seen are, are removing the leaves that are most infected like this which is just gonna result in bare plants eventually. So that's also not an, an effective method. All right. Other chemical options are with these two active ingredients. So Calagreen uh, uses potassium bicarbonate, which is also effective. And the chlorothanol, <laughs> sorry, um, is also an effective method for powdery mildew. But um, whenever you're trying these methods, it's important to maybe just try it on a plant or two before doing it to the whole uh, the whole bed. All right, phytoplasma. So phytoplasma is a bacteria without a cell wall, uh, which means it cannot survive very long outside of its vector or host. So uh, the, the vectors, the way it gets transmitted is actually through leaf hoppers. And, um, and then that is how it gets moved from plant to plant. And so leaf hoppers really prefer certain plants over the others, but they tend to like to taste the plant first and see if they like it. And even that little bit of uh, tasting can transmit phytoplasma. And so we found this in Veronica last summer and it tends to look like herbicide damage. And I think we've got a picture on the next, um, the next slide here, but it can infect ornamentals. And in looking at uh, it, it can tend to actually create a misshapen flower. It can look kind of uh, just distorted or flattened. And we usually think of herbicide damage from that. Other examples here with other cut flowers is it's just creating these deformities of the bloom. So this is not herbicide damage in this case. Um, let's see here. So Claudio asked that if you see a mis shapen flower in your farm this year, let us know because we would love to test for it and see um, and see what it is. If, if you see deformities happening across the entire bed, then it's likely some kind of herbicide got in and, and caused that. But if it's just a plant here and there we that's deformed, we'd love to test it. So let us know. Um, management is to monitor for leaf hoppers with sticky cards. So those yellow sticky cards are so important because you can manage all, or not manage, but monitor all of the different pests and see what's coming, coming through. Removing the symptomatic uh, plants because we know it can get transmitted plant to plant. And just knowing that once it's infected, there's no cure, it's not coming back from that. All right, the last one then um, to touch on today is Snapdragon rust. This is one that I think Megan Lewis remembers quite well from our trials with Snapdragon. We particularly saw it in the, in the high tunnel a lot, um, and we saw it across the state as well. So rust is an obligate parasite, which means it needs living tissue to survive. And most plants um, can get infected, sorry, rust, sorry. So rust is very host specific, and um, it really only will have one or two hosts. So most plants can be infected with at least one species of rust and it's a really, it's specific to that. So if you've got rust on your garlic, it's not gonna be the same rust that's on snapdragons. 
Um, infection occurs on wet leaves. So these high humid environments or using sprinkler irrigation can make things worse. Um, but in, when we're, in terms of thinking about snapdragon rust specifically, it only has one host. So it's aptly named snapdragon rust because it can only exist um, on snapdragon. So this is what it looks like if you, especially when you turn over the leaf and look on the bottom side, it's a lot of little um, brown or kind of copper colored dots. And so cultural management is to remove the fallen leaves and plant debris. Plant debris, um, rust can actually overwinter in the soil on that debris. So removing it at the end of the season helps a lot. Uh, using a bit wider plant spacing, just again, um, as was the case for other pathogens, it just really helps get that airflow in reducing humidity. Avoiding overhead irrigation, going to drip irrigation can help. Um, trying to find a, a disease-free plants in cuttings or growing plants from seed is important. Um, plastic mulch can actually help uh, you know, in covering the soil too, in reducing incidence of rust. But the big one here for management is getting rid of that leaf litter. And I know it's so tempting that we wanna increase our organic matter any way we can, um, but if, it's, if it seems disease, it's best to get rid of it. Another thing is um, oftentimes we warn against fall tillage because it in, in say that, you know, promote, if you're gonna till, do it in the spring, but fall tillage can actually help in this case because it can take that um, plant debris and incorporate it into the soil, which will increase the rate of decomposition and keeps it off the surface. So, and, it, and, and rust will not infect the roots. So if it's below ground, um, that's a way to control it. Uh, a little bit on management here. There's a, there's a lot of different chemical products that you can pick from. Um, make sure to apply when it's first used. And I, I'm definitely speaking out of my expertise here, but uh, Claudia wanted me to point out that there's these different codes on the chemical products um, or group numbers. And you can see it if you look at the, the label for the different chemicals, it'll say what group number it is. And the big thing here uh, is to not apply the same uh, chemical group for more than six weeks because there's a lot of concern about resistance that can happen. So wanting to switch that up. And then also don't pick products in group 11 because that can cause phytotoxicity in Snapdragon. So this will all be posted so you can get this list of chemicals and everything else that was in this talk. Um, 